welcome friends to this monthly meeting which is organized by isha the institute for the study of human awareness the purpose of these meetings as i have been mentioning before is so that we can re-trigger our journey on the spiritual path our mind being such and the distractions of life being such we are often pulled away by these distractions from our spiritual journey the spiritual journey is a continuous thing it has to be built up in a momentum it is not a casual thing that happens once in a while you may have sudden feelings of spiritual growth of spiritual presence of something but those are only casual events that happen but if you want to have a sustained experience of what the spiritual journey is like then you have to keep it up on a daily basis some people say we are very busy throughout the week and the only time we find to meditate or to do some spiritual exercise is on weekends they work hard they do meditation for several hours on weekends but during the rest of the week they fritter away all the gathered momentum in worldly tasks and worldly obligations and worldly attachments then they start all over again therefore it is very necessary my master great master hazur maharaj baba sawan singh used to write letters to people that the momentum is very necessary for spiritual practice and even if you are maintaining that contact with your spiritual journey for 5 minutes a day and 5 minutes at night it's good enough to maintain the momentum but to give up entirely for several days and then pick it up and say i don't know why nothing is happening you don't have to say that because you can see what is happening that the distractions are far outweigh the practice you are doing the reason why even 5 minutes of good quality high quality meditation can sustain your momentum is because meditation is not done for the sake of an exercise it is not a mechanical practice meditation is done to remember the lord to remember the master to remember your guru and once you remember even for one minute the memory continues the feeling of love and devotion is a very strange feeling it does not depend upon how much time you give to it it depends upon how high the quality of that passion is if you are passionate about your love and devotion then even a little remembrance holds on with you and that is why 5 minutes of high quality meditation is better than hours and hours of mechanical meditation what do i mean by high quality meditation by high quality meditation i mean meditation done with love and devotion why does that make it a high quality meditation because the practice of meditation by itself is a mechanical exercise and is an exercise in the body it's an exercise in the mind even repetition of mantras repetition of words is merely a mental exercise so if you do it mechanically you are working within your own mind and not doing anything to cross it on the other hand love does not come from the mind it comes from our soul in fact it comes from our true home or such kind the love we experience here is coming from our true home and is represented here with the life force which we call our soul our soul represents love and devotion whereas the rest of the practice is mental so if we only do mental practice it does not yield any results so far as true spiritual progress is concerned for making true spiritual progress we must go beyond the mind into our spiritual realm and that is where our true home is all these bodies we have upon ourselves whether it is this physical body or it is the body of our senses which is called the astral body or it is the body we call mind which is the causal body these three bodies have limited time during which they stay here with us and then they disappear 
each one of them has a length and duration in time. In time they all go away. None of that stays with us. But the soul that is using these bodies is immortal, has no birth and no death and is always there. Our true identity is that soul. Our true spiritual journey is the soul going back to its own totality, to its own true home. That is why my master told me that his spiritual journey does not start from here. This is just a preparation. His spiritual journey starts from par brahm, which means beyond the mind, beyond brahm, and ends in such hunt. That is where you discover you are a soul and you discover by your spiritual journey that you are never separated from one that was the only creative power. This is a very big example of how we are caught up in mental games and think we are on spiritual journeys. The mind is a very powerful instrument that we have got. It's very good if you use it positively. It is a dangerous enemy if you don't use it positively. The mind thinks, the mind rationalizes, the mind makes sense of things by using logic and rationalization. This function of the mind keeps us tied up continuously with things that are around us in these physical, astral and causal worlds. We never have a chance to look at who we are, who we really are, where is our true home, where is it originating from. We are constantly occupied in the activities of the mind. So the mind becomes an enemy of ours. So much so that we give the life force, the power of living, the power of consciousness to the mind to make it work. Just like we give that power of life to the senses, we give the same power of life to this physical body to make it alive. It is our soul's power that makes these three alive. If the soul withdraws its power, all three die. So that is why we are sharing our own power to make these accessories to ourselves work. When we make the mind a living thing because we give it life, it assumes an entity by itself. And we allow that to grow because we begin to identify with the mind. When the mind thinks, we begin to feel that we are thinking. We don't need to think. Thinking is not our natural activity at all. Our natural activities are very few. They are to experience love. They are to experience intuitive knowledge that comes by gut feeling. And they are to appreciate beauty and bliss. That's all. That's all the soul needs. It does not need anything else. What else we are creating by using these accessories, such as the mind, is to create new experiences. New experiences in time and space, which give us a variety of experiences for the soul through these agencies to experience. These are all experiences being created around us. And we have a variety of experiences which we like. And when the show is over, we go back to our true home. But when we get so caught up in these experiences, we forget that they were only for a little while, for a short time, then we are in trouble. Because look at the experiences we have with our third body, the physical body. It covers the first body mind, covers the second body, the senses. It's a third body we are wearing around ourselves. And the third body creates a material world and material experiences of this physical world. We get so much trapped in these physical activities and physical people, physical things. We get so attached to them, we take them as our only reality. And so much so, we want to be with them, we want to possess them. We want to possess objects and we want to possess people. None of them ever go with us. Even in the physical body, we leave them all behind. We see so many people dying. They were collecting so many things, making so many friendships, so many relationships. All of them disappeared when they died. But when we are alive, we don't see that we are going to die. Sometimes we feel everybody will die and we will still be here. That is not true. We all die and we all leave everything behind. But when we die and we regret, why did we spend so much time making these attachments? Those very attachments pull us back to come again. And that is why we keep on coming back again and again 
because of these attachments to things and to people. Now, if we were to say these are only things to enjoy while we are here, this is just a show, a stage show, and we are all characters, we are playing a role, show will end, we'll all go back home. If we take this attitude, we will not have to come back again because we will not make those kinds of attachments, nor are we going to try to possess things like we do, and therefore there is no need to come back. If we want to come back, certainly it will be our own will to come back, but we will not be bound to come back. But this attachment to things here is making us almost obligated to come back, and that is how this whole sustenance of this physical world is going on, because these souls, trapped by creating living minds, by putting the life force into their minds, and then identifying with the minds, they get trapped in the pleasures of the mind, they get trapped into the attractions of the mind, and they get attached to things to which they are attracted, and they come here over and over again. Perfect living masters, whom we call Satgurus, true gurus, those masters, they come here to tell us that these are not our things, these are not our people, we have come merely to have an experience, and it is time, if we are tired, to go back home. And they tell us how to go back home. They do not come here to improve the condition of this physical world, because they see a thousand of reformers who are trying to do that. It is not their role. They do not come here to make us better people, because there are thousands of people who are teaching us how to be better people. They do not come to found any religion, because the constant religions and ceremonies are being performed all over, and they are not going to set up a separate small group of people, that you are the only privileged ones. They come for all seekers who want to go back home, no matter where they are, no matter what their religion, no matter what their caste or creed, no matter what the color of their skin, no matter what their age or gender. Their role is simply to take those souls back. They have not come for physical bodies. They have not come for our minds. They don't judge what our karma is, because karma is mental. They don't judge anything mental that we have. They judge the seeking of the soul. When the soul seeks to go back home, and that only happens when the soul experiencing this creation, experiencing all these that are around us in the physical, astral, and causal worlds, is tired of it and says, I have had enough. If a soul is happy with, with this continuing experience, they don't interfere. They say, if you are happy with what is happening around you, go and enjoy yourself. Your time has not come yet. Your time only comes when the inner feeling, inmost feeling in you says, I have had enough. This is not my home. This is not the kind of life I think I could have in my home. These pairs of opposites of pain and pleasure, of misery and so much contentment, all combined together, cannot be my home. This is not my place. I am tired of it. I want to go back home. When the soul cries for that, these Satgurus, these masters appear in their life. They don't care where the soul is. They don't care what religion it belongs to. They come simply for that soul, not for the body, not for the mind, not for the nationality, and not for any group that you belong to, not for any religion. They come wherever the seeker is, no matter what religion is believing in, no matter what practice he is in, no matter what his financial situation is, no matter what his karmic situation is, no matter how good or bad he is. They are not judgment. They are not coming with any judgment of good and bad. Because we are all good and bad. We all have a mind which makes us good and bad. And the mind divides itself into two sections and puts up a small part of itself into a conscience. He calls it conscience and separates itself so the main part of the mind tempts us to go into things which the conscience says, no, that's not right. The conscience develops its values based upon the society in which we are born, the values that are having in the experience around us, and that is influencing our conscience. And that conscience is constantly creating conflict in the mind between good and bad, and good and bad is created in the mind. These perfect living masters don't come to judge this. They know it's a trap. They know we are all trapped into this. Even karma is a trap. Karma, the law of 
action and reaction which makes us come back again and again based upon the intention and actions we perform in one life is also a trap. It is a trap that creates some experiences so we get attached to some of those experiences. It still remains a trap because by getting attached to things we come again and again and cannot get free, cannot go back to our true home. And that is why these perfect living masters do not come to judge us. They do not come to look at our record. When they see us as physical beings, they are physical beings like ourselves, they are physical ordinary people like ourselves. When they come and look at us, they do not look at the body. They do not look at our senses. They do not look at our karma. They do not look at our mind. They look at the soul. Is the soul seeking to go back home? If the answer is yes, they will take that back. We all undergo different experiences and a certain time in our experience, we feel we have had enough. That is the time when they come into our life and they see we are ready to go and they accept us. By accepting us, they become our true friends, true companions and co-travelers. They travel with us back to the true home. They do not come as teachers. They don't teach anything. They come as friends to take us back home because they have awareness of the way back home and they carry that awareness with them when they come into our life. Perfect living masters are not superhuman beings. They are ordinary human beings, just like us. They are born like us. They die like us. They fall sick like us. They are treated good, good and bad by people like us. They eat and drink like us. They, they live a life exactly ordinary like us. The only difference is that they, in their awareness, in their consciousness, are aware of the whole show of creation and of the Creator. They don't have that experience because they one day did meditation and got that experience and have come back as enlightened people. They are not enlightened in that sense. They carry enlightenment with them at all times. They are constantly aware of what the show is like. They are constantly aware of every level of consciousness. They are constantly aware of the functioning of the body, the senses, the mind and the soul and its totality. They don't have to look back to find out the truth. The truth they carry with them at all times. That is why they are such ordinary people like us and yet their consciousness is totally different from ours. And that is why when they look at us, they look at the whole of ourself, which is truly our soul, which is the reality, covered by these covers for temporary experience. They see that. They see the soul is now tired of this experience and has to be taken back home. If a master were a supernatural person, was trying to read your mind, is able to guess what you are doing, he's a psychic then. He may be a mind reader. They don't come like that. They are not trying to impress you that we are something extraordinary. They keep on emphasizing how ordinary they are. And their ordinariness is what catches us because true friendship, if you look, look back at your own history, own experience, true friendship is between ordinary people. You cannot be a friend with a supernatural person. You cannot be a friend with supernatural beings. You Friendship. Friendship is prior to the relationship of a guru and chela, of a master and disciple. If a master is not a friend of yours, he is no master. Because if he is merely a teacher of spiritual teachings, you could get the same teachings from any number of books. You could hear very learned people giving the same teachings. The teachings are not relevant at all when the question is of going back to our true home. No teachings can take us there. Teachings can give us information. Teachings can give us a lot of information. But getting information does not generate real experience. Suppose you say you want to have a real experience of a physical experience, say, of a beautiful place. People think that in Hawaii, the beaches there are called beaches of paradise. Because on the physical plane, they are very beautiful places. People go there for vacation. Supposing you hear from somebody, there is a beautiful paradise on this earth in Hawaii and you want to go there. And you take all the books and read about Hawaii. 
and read all the time tables and time schedules of the planes that go there and keep on reading every day, you won't reach there. Reading of books is like that. Reading of scriptures is like that. Scriptures are books. We have somehow transformed some writings as if they themselves can t- take us anywhere. No writings have ever taken anybody anywhere. I get surprised sometimes to see that even what the book says, we don't apply that to the book. The books themselves are saying that reading of books will not lead you anywhere. The book is not the thing. The thing is something else. And yet, we think that the book contains everything in the Bible. Most versions of the Bible, there are so many versions of the Bible now. And the latest one that is read in this country is from the 14th version, approved by a king of England, King James. He approved that version. Okay, this is the word of God now. Now you read. But fortunately, that book preserves the Gospel of John, which the opening verses says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now that Word is spelt with a W capital. All things were made by Him, and nothing that was made was made except by Him. The verses of the John Gospel in the Bible. That's the Word. Creative power. It even preceded, according to the way it is put in the John's Gospel, even before God, that the Word pre-existed God. It is the nature of God that brought out what a concept of God is. And yet, you look at the Columbia Dictionary or the Oxford Dictionary and look up the meaning of a word with a double W capital. It says, word means the Bible. Did the Bible create the universe? But that's how the dictionary says. Not only dictionary. The whole Christian community believes it. How can that be? In, in a Guru Granth Sahib, the six scriptures, which was written by human beings who were gurus, each one of the gurus had a human being as a guru, ordinary human being who under, underwent tortures for the sake of their missions. And yet, they believe that the book is now the Guru. How do they believe that? Because somebody, not in the Granth Sahib all, at all, somebody later added a phrase that from now onwards you should believe the Granth to be the Guru. None of the Gurus said that at all. Somebody told me, isn't it, isn't it in the Granth Sahib that uh, from now on the Panth will believe in the Granth now only? I said, show me. I have read the Granth Sahib several times. The whole of it. I have not found that phrase anywhere. It's not in the Granth Sahib at all. It's not in the teachings of the Gurus. On the other hand, the Granth Sahib itself says, Padhiyajete arja, padhiyajete maas, padhiyajete swas maas. Nanak hon. It says, if you read day and night, if you read with every breath, if you read your whole life, if you keep on reading every month and your whole life, you will get nothing except your home man, your ego. It ultimately, it's all your ego that you have read so much. Who is saying this? The same Granth we believe is the Guru. If you keep on reading these scriptures, you will discover that they have themselves talked against the acceptance of any teaching to be a Guru. A Guru is not that. A Guru is one who, as an ordinary human being, befriends us, takes us into his Sharan, into his care and takes us back to his true home. The same thing is true of other religions. I had the opportunity during my student days in Harvard University to study 11 major religions of the world. And I was seeing whether they have something really in common. Since they all believe in God, they all claim there is one God. That was the beauty of it, that they all said there is one God. In Islam, they did not believe that there is a God for Muslims. They describe Rabb, God, as Rabbi Alameen, not Rabbi Muslimin. The Rabb is for the whole Alam, for the whole world. God is only one. So I said, at least these major religions, they must be accepting that there is something common. The only common thing I found was, each one said, we are the only true one, all others are false. 
when i meet the disciples of different masters guru teachers and they follow their own gurus different ones human beings even i ask them oh, what does your guru teach you he says our guru is the only real one all is a fake this is the only common denomination between all these masters and books and and religions these masters have never come to create any religion look at the history it's available to us in large extent and they never came to set up any particular group any religion any society they came just for the sake of the people seekers who are ready to take them back home so we have divided ourselves a mind which is capable of division all the time which divides is an analytical tool an analytical tool will always divide to analyze it's not a synthetic tool it's not a synthesis synthesis comes from the soul a soul can look at the big picture can see the whole thing the mind cannot the mind has to break it into pieces to see and the mind function the same way on spiritual knowledge and tries to divide it and therefore we divide acting under the mind we divide these great truths that have been shared by these people who attained total consciousness totality of consciousness we divide them into different religions different groups societies and so on they don't come to establish any society these perfect living masters they come for the seekers no matter where you are so we have to understand the spiritual path is not a set of religions set of religious rites or ceremonies is there is nothing external at all it is nothing to do what you externally it's something to do internally to discover who you really are to do that you have to go within yourself and to go within yourself you don't have to follow anything outside if you cannot go within outside you can seek help you can seek help from anybody who knows better than you if somebody has gone one step ahead of you take help that is why and people come to me and say we want to find a perfect guru i said find any guru have you gone one step if not find a guru who has gone one step find a teacher who has gone one step in teach you how to go one step if after that you are not satisfied another teacher will come and take you further this arrangement that when we are tired of this universe tired of this experience we want to go home want to go home to a true home has been made by us right in the beginning of creation is not being made today we ourselves as souls what are souls they are units of consciousness and belong to totality of consciousness we are part of god we are part of the totality at all times we have never separated our experience separated us we created an experience around us which created a sense of separation and that experience has been multiplied several times as we created different levels of experiences and right now we are here six positions removed from our totality and we are now working in this experience but we have not separated the inner inmost self of ours is still the creative power which we call god or the creative or the totality of consciousness therefore it's amazing that as a human being with a human body we have within itself not only the covers inner covers like the senses and the mind also the soul and not only the soul also the creator of the soul and its totality everything is inside the deeper you go inside yourself the more you will discover these perfect living masters only teach us for the sake of our mind how to go within but the teaching of how to go within which we call meditation meditation at the third eye center behind the eyes because that begins to pull our attention within and takes us away from outside experience that meditation within ourselves is a starting point still mechanical but what pulls us inside is our own totality our own self and it pulls us with love and devotion how do we have that actual experience because our truth our true guru our true master is inside always never outside the true master is our own self in its highest form it's inside us we close our eyes thinking we are looking inside we don't see anything that is why the same true master appears in our experience outside as a human being 
he does not have to appear as any un, unusual type of human being because he is just a representative of our own self and therefore appears like ourselves outside and helps us to go within. The, the perfect living master who is a human being never says he is a perfect living master, never says he is anything more than a human being, sometimes more ordinary than ordinary people. But what he says is that go within. He does not say follow me. He says follow the guru inside you. And his whole method is to take us within ourselves, not to pull us outside. He is not saying come outside I will show you great places of worship, great, great moments that you can enjoy outside. He doesn't say that. He says if you want to find anything real, start going within. And the further you go, you will find the true guru inside. He's always inside. The real power that's going to take you in, the reality itself is inside you, not outside. The Guru is part of the reality outside. If everything else is maya, an illusion outside, how can a human being that we see be more real than the rest? He's equally unreal. The body that we see of a Guru outside is as unreal as other bodies or any other experience. If this is all unreal, he has to be unreal. Then where is the real Guru? inside. The outside guru merely helps us by way of our own arrangement, our own setting up of this experience to bring us inside to the true guru who takes us inside. The very first encounter with a real guru takes place inside. When an outside person who is acting as a guru because you can't see him inside, with his totality of consciousness, is able to pick us up because he can see the aspiration of the soul, the seeking of the soul. When he picks up and says, I accept you, we call it the grant of the greatest blessing, sometimes called initiation, nam daan. You can use any phrase for that. Diksha, many words have been used. A guru grants that it is a promise. From today onwards, we are together till we reach back home. That's the promise. It is not... Something that is uh, saying, I teach you the way to go, now you go. That is not the relationship with the perfect Sadhguru, with the perfect living master. The perfect living master makes us our friend and a co-traveler and travels with us. The only part of the journey that we do without knowing about the presence of the Guru inside is till we open our eyes to see. Till we can open the inner eye and see that the Guru is really inside, the Master is really inside, that's the journey we have to perform. It's a very, very small section of the journey to our true home. And that's all we have to perform. What happens after that? We are constantly in companionship with the Guru and travel from stage to stage, from one level of consciousness to another with the Guru. So that is why it's important to know that a Guru appears in our life as a friend. If somebody says, that I, I have a guru who lived 2,000 years ago. That's your mind. How do you know anything about 2,000 years ago? How can you possibly have? If somebody says, my guru lives thousands of miles away in the mountains of Tibet, it's his own mind. These are all mind-making things. Mind makes up all these things. And there's no verification at all. Therefore, just going by the mind creates a big problem because the mind is not interested in taking you inside. The mind is interested in keeping you attached to the pleasures it has enjoyed in the physical experiences, astral experiences outside. And that is why a guru must be one who can hold your hand and be your friend. The other day I mentioned the story of Sheikh Farid, one of the mystic, and his writings are available. He's also mentioned in Guru Granth Sahib, the holy book of the Sikhs. Sheikh Farid was the disciple of Sheikh Qutbuddin. And Sheikh Qutbuddin was a perfect living master. Sheikh Farid told his son, get initiated by Qutbuddin because he's got old in his physical age and he will die. We have to have a living person to initiate us. Take advantage. He's alive. Go to the Murshid, the Murshid the Kamal, perfect master and get initiated. The son, like all young people said, no, Dad, I have plenty of time. Father, I will just take my own time. When I am ready, I'll go. Meanwhile, Sheikh Kutbuddin died. 
when the son heard that the master has died, he ran, he shaved off his head, which was the custom in those days before you could be accepted by a master, and lay his head on the feet of the dead body of Sheikh Qutbuddin. Looking at that, Sheikh Farid says, Son, this body on whose feet you have put your head is a person for whom I have the highest regard, highest love, highest devotion. And yet I tell you, you are getting nothing now. Even one minute after death of the master is too late. Sorry, this is just a body. It's just a dead body. Master's gone. Of course, later on, Sheikh Farid himself initiated his son. But he said to his son, only if you can hold the hand of a sheikh and become his friend can you say he is going to be your teacher and master on the spiritual realm. It is not, it is not something of a mental belief. It is something of an experience with somebody who has attained that state of consciousness that he is constantly aware of that. How do you know that an ordinary human being is a perfect living master? If he is so ordinary, it is even more difficult to know. Can you, looking at a person, say he is a master or not? The answer is no. Can you find a perfect living master? Answer is no. Then, then where do we stand if we are seekers? If we are seekers and want to find a master, how do we find? The answer is simple. If we are talking of a human being whose consciousness is total, even as a human being, he should be able to recognize us rather than our recognizing him. Therefore, the truth is that when the seeker is ready, the master appears in his life. When the chela is ready, the guru appears. That's what they say. They don't say when the chela is ready, he can find a guru. When a disciple is ready, the master appears in his life. How does he appear? Master can appear through coincidences, circumstances, thousands of ways to appear. Physical life is under control. This control, where to appear, where not to appear. And he will follow the rules of creation of this universe and appear as a friend. And from there, still, how do you know? He has appeared, he's still an ordinary human being. Then how do you know he is a perfect living master? You will know it only by association with him as a friend and finding that the nature of his love for you is not like the ordinary one. It is totally unconditional. It has no judgment in it. The more you will experience that love of a master, you will discover there is something very unusual going on. There is no judgment. He doesn't bother whether we are good or bad. A perfect living master loves us if we love him. He loves us if we don't love him. He loves us if we hate him. He loves us if we kill him. That's the quality of his love. That unconditional love does not exist except with the one who has crossed the mind and gone into the spiritual regions. So that is how you come to know that there is such a pull coming of that unconditional love. Where is it coming from? The love is pulling your soul and you feel that. The mind thinks about it and doubts it. The mind argues with you. No, no, you could be mistaken. It could be the devil. It could be something else going on. How can you be drawn to this? But the love ultimately overrides the mind. And even the mind becomes subservient. Then what happens? We are looking at this physical world outside. Small, small coincidences start happening which were not happening before. We begin to see this thing wasn't normal to happen. How has it happened? We begin to regard the little things and little miracles. And we are immediately able to associate it with the new person we have met who has given us so much unconditional love. So evidence begins to mount both outside and inside. When we think of that person, his image comes and he can give us answers to our questions. He becomes a friend inside and outside. And these experiences add up. What do these experiences do to us? They build faith. And faith is a very important thing. Because it is faith that will ultimately override the doubts of the mind. Now faith can be two types. There can be a blind faith. Somebody says that's a very enlightened person. Whatever he says, believe. We go whatever he says, we believe. And the belief remains the same. Whether anything happens or not. 
and there is blind faith. Somebody tell if somebody told us that, that God is sitting on top of this house and we believed it, He'll always be sitting on top of the house and we'll make no progress. But the faith that comes stage by stage, step by step, by one thing happening miraculously and adding to another one is a living faith. It grows like living things. It's the living faith that ultimately overrides the mind and the doubts of the mind. And these, begin, these things begin to happen after we have had some association with such a being we call a perfect living master. That is why the only way to find such a perfect living master is to seek within yourself, not outside. You can run all over the world looking for masters may never find one. But if you seek within yourself, a master will appear in your life by coincidence. And wait and see the show. There's also a great show to discover who the master is, is a great experience in life. Because as you have discovery by events happening outside and events happening in your meditation inside, no meditation can pull you faster inside than the meditation of love and devotion. When we love something, we run after it. Therefore, it's love and devotion that we have with a friend who we have seen outside and we talk to that friend inside, that love and devotion pulls us inside. Therefore, meditation to become qualitative, to be of high quality, is a meditation where you talk to your friend, associate with your friend, insight. That is meditation. Merely repeating words is not meditation. Merely repeating mantras is not meditation. Merely doing similar is not meditation. These are mechanical devices designed to prevent you from thinking of other things. These are designed just to make you Help yourself with putting attention behind the eyes. No more than that. If you keep on repeating certain words, no matter what they are, you are not allowing the mind to think of other things. It's a simple thing. It's a simple element of squeezing out other words of thought by pumping in words of your joy. If they are given by a holy person, we like them more because we associate with the holiness of those words. They are still spoken words. They are still physical words. These words won't take you that far. It's the love and devotion that you use while uttering the words to a friend that makes it good meditation. So that is why a meditation should be done with love and devotion to get any results. Don't worry if the guru you have, if the teacher you have is only taking you one step. We haven't even gone one step. Let's go one step. If your seeking is more than that, another guru will appear in your life and take you further. It's an automatic thing. So therefore, one is never to worry. Supposing somebody says, only one perfection. It's like a little child says, my uncle is going to a college and I want to go to college. No child, you have to go to school first. No, but I want to be in the same place. Well, you, he was a child and he was also going through the same stages. The spiritual path is not just a leap into one kind of experience. You leap into several experiences, one after the other. And each one raises the level of your awareness and the level of your consciousness. And as it rises, you begin to be ready for more. What determines how far you will go is the seeking in your heart. People go to perfect living masters and seek worldly things. They seek cure from illnesses without taking medicine. They want to have pass examinations without working for it. They want to do things in the world. Sometimes the master is given. And we should understand that also. Why do the masters give in sometimes? I'll tell you a little story. Once a gardener, a mali, was planting a little plant. And he had a little sapling in his hand. He put it in the soil and was watering it, putting a little fertilizer on it. A young man passed by and he looked at him. He said, Mr. Gardener, what are you wasting your time for? You're putting a little plant here. Don't you see all around it are the weeds? You're putting food, the weeds are going to eat it up, not your plant. And the gardener looks up and says, have you ever planted this before? He said, I haven't done, I'm not a planter of anything, but I can see the weeds around where you are planting the little sapling of your plant. And the gardener says, I have planted this before. 
and I know that there are weeds. I also know that the water I am giving and the fertilizer I am giving is being eaten up mostly by the weeds, little bit by my plant. But the plant will keep on growing and the weeds do not grow. They will be all around eating most of the food as the plant grows big and becomes a bush. Under the shade of that plant, these weeds will wither away and die. I have seen this. Here in this example, that gardener is our guru. He is our master. He is planting the seed of love in our heart. That's the seed that is going to sprout and take us back to our true home. He puts that seed around the seed are all our worldly desires. How to get well out of illness, how to pass exam, how to make more money, how to win a lottery, all those things. Those are all the weeds. And sometimes he gives in and feeds those. So that, why does he feed them? Because our idea of his competence is based upon what we are getting around us. So he gives into some of these little, little things. So our faith grows. This man has something. We don't know, but he can do some miracles like these. We have seen the miracles. But when the plant of love grows to a point where it overwhelms everything, all the desires, local desires disappear. And they, like weeds, are destroyed by the big love plant that the master has planted. That is why these perfect living masters, they know our nature. They know where we are. They feed exactly what we have. That is why the spiritual path is not a set of instructions. It's not a one set of rules that you can follow. It's customized for each one of us. Because each one of us has a separate problem or separate destiny, separate karma. We have come with a different picture. We are all different in our karmic patterns here. And that is why the perfect living master sees that pattern and takes us back home, steering us through that pattern according to where we stand and what we need to do. That is why a perfect living master can give very different instructions to two different people. And we say, what kind of person is he? He is giving different instructions. There must be no reality about his instructions. Instructions are only to take us to the truth, which is beyond instructions. And that is why instructions don't matter. We can't see the karmic pattern. They can see. I remember my own great master's days. A man comes and master sitting here with many of us sitting around him. He's sitting on the floor. He's sitting in a small chair. And a man comes running. And he says, Master, this girl I have brought is my daughter and she has just passed high school and she wants to go to college. I think we, our family thinks this is not for girls, she should get married. What do you say, Master, we want your advice? He said, what's the difference between girls and boys? You should educate the girl. It's only proper, they are all equal. Go, put her in college. The man says, thank you, Master girl is happy, they go away. Then comes, maybe within five minutes, another man comes with his daughter. It's a coincidence that within five minutes, another situ situation like that comes up. Another man comes with his daughter, says the same thing. Master, this girl has just passed high school and she wants to go into education and the family thinks that he should be in, uh, married. Master says, what have girls to do with education? Their role is in the house. She'll make a very good housewife. Just stop stop thinking about education. Marry her. Within five minutes, master changed his mind. No. He could see the karma pattern of those two different girls. He could see what was good for those people to be ultimately able to rise above the karmic pattern and go into the true home. Masters do that all the time. And therefore, it's a customized spiritual path for each one of us. And that's why when we go to a master, he looks at our soul, looks at our karmic pattern, looks at our trap and finds a way out so we can, without disturbing the rest of the experience around, we can still go back. Master don't come to disturb the experience. They are one with the creative part, the creator of the experience. Why would they disturb it? If they are themselves conscious of the creator of this experience, why would they disturb it? They don't disturb it. They work their way exactly in the middle of this experience that's going on. And that's why they function like ordinary people. 
It is only association with these people that we can discover who they are. And if we are seekers, we are pulled right from day one. We are pulled. The mind doesn't believe. The conflict is between mind and soul. This conflict between mind and soul is a continuous thing. We don't sometimes realize because we hide our soul inside and work only with the mind. We put the power of the soul into the mind and make the mind ourselves. And instead of using the power of the soul, which can be used anytime, if you rely more on intuition, intuitive knowledge, not thinking knowledge, but what is what you call the gut feeling, if you rely more on that than on the thinking part, you'll be more spiritual and you'll find you'll go less wrong. When we go with our thinking, we make mistakes all the time. And later on we say, I wish I had known this earlier. I wish I knew that part earlier. Because the mind can only function on what knowledge it has in front of it. It cannot function on what is forgotten or what is hidden. It only has that knowledge and decides upon that. If something new comes up, the mind says, I made a mistake. That is why the intuitive self, the soul, takes care of the whole picture. It's cumulative. It's not that particular part of the knowledge that's in front of us. And intuition comes from there. If you lead intuitive lives, go by the keys that you have. Intuition is followed by something happening outside also. It's a combination of an inner intuitive feeling, a gut feeling, and a coincidence happening outside. For example, you have a question in your mind. Whether you should undertake a particular project or not. And you don't want to reason about it because reasoning keeps on conflicting. This is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. You say, let me rely upon my, upon my soul today for once. Whether I should take up the project or not. And the gut feelings is constantly saying, do it, do it, do it. We are trying to say, no, it's dangerous, it's not good. The gut feeling is saying, do it. You say, I don't know whether I can believe my inner feeling or not. Sometimes an inner feeling can also be mental, I don't know. You go out and drive your car. And an advertisement is there on some billboard in the street about some other project. And it says, do this project. You read it. You are not reading the rest of the ad, what is saying. You are saying, this is what I was thinking. How did that come outside? The coincidences happening outside match the intuitive gut feeling we have inside. Again and again it will happen. So we do not get confirmation of our intuitive intelligence only from inside. We also get from outside. This is a remarkable life, how these things change. Once you are on a spiritual path guided by a perfect living master, these events increase in number and they keep on happening. And I hear these stories every day. How more and more of these coincidences start happening and how the gut feeling is being corroborated by some unrelated event outside. This is not merely a spiritual path where you have some teachings and you go and do meditation by that. It's a personal relationship with another human being. A relationship of true love, a relationship of true devotion. And that is what takes us beyond the mind. I hope we will all who are doing meditation make sure that we don't do it mechanically but we put our love and devotion for the master, for the guru in it. That will immediately increase the value of that meditation. Once again, thank you very much for joining me today and I know some people have come for the first time and I will be happy to see them afterwards. Uh, we'll have a lunch break now. So I'll be very happy to see you later in the afternoon. Thank you very much.